வணக்கம் ஸ்டிஃப்னஸ் ஆஃப் த ப்ராக்சிமல் இன்டர்ஃபலன்ஷியல் ஜாயிண்ட் ஆஃப் த ஃபிங்கர் இஸ் குவாய்ட் அ காமன் ப்ராப்ளம் தி மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் இஸ் குவாய்ட் கன்ஃபியூசிங் அண்ட் த ரிசல்ட்ஸ் மே நாட் பி ஆஸ் எக்ஸ்பெக்டட் போத் ஃபார் த சர்ஜன் அண்ட் ஃபார் த பேஷண்ட் So what are the intricacies involved in managing a patient with a stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint? How do we decide what surgery is to be done? And how is the surgery done? What is the post-operative protocol? What therapy should be given? All these questions are answered in this video in the session on surgery at GK Hand Surgery. We are going to discuss today in this video a patient with a stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint of the finger in extension and see the surgical management of such a condition. We shall first see the details about the case then see how the decision has been made to arrive at the surgical plan then how the patient was counseled about the surgery, the requirements for the surgery, the markings for the incision to be made, the anesthesia that is given. the actual procedure per se and the nuances of the procedure and finally the post operative protocol that was followed for this patient we shall also see the results of this surgery this 25 year old male manual laborer had sustained an open injury 8 months back when he fell down while walking a diagnosis of a dislocation of the pip joint of the little finger on the right hand was made and this was treated with reduction of the dislocation and k wire fixation of the joint and skin suturing immobilization was done in a plaster of paris slab for 3 weeks k wire removal was done at 6 weeks and no therapy was started after that on clinical examination the proximal interphalangeal joint of the right hand little finger is kept in a position of extension there is a scar on the volar aspect of the pip crease about 3 cm long there is no range of movement at the proximal interphalangeal joint either active or passive but there is active flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint with a weakness of extension the metacarpophalangeal joint of the little finger the range of movements is full the other fingers and thumb are intact plain x ray of the right hand shows a narrow joint space at the level of the proximal interphalangeal joint of the little finger and the articular surface is not intact as it appears very irregular so the clinical diagnosis as we have seen it is a post traumatic sequelae resulting in stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint in extension on the right hand little finger involving the dominant hand in a 25 year old manual laborer and the problem has been of 8 months duration so now we need to take a decision about what is to be done to correct this problem and we shall see the thought process by which we take a decision but before that we shall see the basics about proximal interphalangeal joint stiffness so that we can get an idea in which direction we need to go because a pip joint stiffness can result from a problem of the capsule or the volar plate of the joint or even a skin contracture restricting the extension or flexion or even a tendon shortening restricting the extension or flexion in certain positions so this means that we can have two types of proximal interphalangeal joint stiffness in the finger pip stiffness in flexion and pip stiffness in extension stiffness of the pip joint in flexion is the more commonly seen problem and this could occur due to the anatomical involvement of any of the following structures the skin and the facial coverings of the finger which when contracted may lead to stiffness shortening of the flexor tendon contracture of the volar plate resulting in flexion contracture or shortening of the collateral ligaments of the pip joint or bony ankylosis at the level of the middle phalanx and proximal phalanx and finally injury to the central slip which has not been treated at all can result in a stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint and the involvement of these structures that we have spoken about can occur in post burn contractures post traumatic stiffness fokeman's ischemic contracture or conditions like dupuytren's contracture also on the other hand pip joint stiffness in extension 
can occur due to the anatomical involvement of any of the following structures like neglected flexor tendon injuries resulting in stiffness in hyperextension of the PIP joint or collateral ligament contractures or scarring and involvement of the extensor tendons on the dorsum of the hand or even the contracture of the skin on the dorsum of the finger. These conditions can occur in post burn contractures, post trauma stiffness as has been seen in the patient under discussion or even in conditions of arthritis. Now we have seen the different conditions and ways in which the proximal interphalangeal joint can be affected. Let us now see what are all the options available for treating these conditions of the joints. The first modality of treatment for any joint problem involving the proximal interphalangeal joint should be therapy. Only if therapy has been given and has failed or is contraindicated we think of the surgical options. When we come to surgical options, there are mainly three options for management of any joint involvement. They are arthrolysis, arthroplasty and arthrodesis. Let us see what these are before we can plan the management for our patient. Arthrolysis refers to release of the scar around the joint. It needs immediate mobilization to prevent the scarring from occurring again and it may need to be combined with tenolysis. So when there is a scar like this around the joint causing the stiffness, when it is released, we can get back the movements of the joint. The indications for arthrolysis are when there is no bony or joint injury and the joint space is present and usually arthrolysis is indicated for flexion contractures of the proximal interphalangeal joint following prolonged immobilization. But when the joint surfaces are damaged or destroyed and the joint space is narrowed or completely lost, the soft tissue envelope may be intact or scarred. For instance, in conditions like post-traumatic osteoarthritis or even rheumatoid arthritis, the damaged joint surface needs to be removed and the joint reconstructed again. This is known as arthroplasty and this can be done by three methods. When the gap between the bones is left as such and allowed to function as a pseudo joint, it is known as gap or excision arthroplasty. But the problem with excision arthroplasty is that the bone ends can get fused again. This can be prevented by interposing some soft tissue between the two ends of the bone and this is known as interposition arthroplasty. And the third method of reconstruction of the joint would be to replace that joint with either a biological structure which may be vascularized or non-vascularized or a synthetic joint. This replacement may involve both or either of the joint surfaces. When there is extensive involvement of the joint surfaces, it may not be possible to get back the movements in the joint again. In such situations, all movements have to be prevented by causing a bony fusion and this is known as arthrodesis. This surgery is indicated when the joint has been destroyed completely and the soft tissue envelope is scarred or lost and most importantly if pain is the main complaint. After going through the basics of the decision making process, we come back to making a decision for the patient under consideration. The problems in this patient are, there is a stiff PIP joint of a single finger in extension. The etiology has been a dorsal dislocation which had been reduced and fixed in extension. The x-ray reveals intact joint space but narrowed. The joint surfaces appear to be damaged. The FDP appears to be working well but there is an extension lag at the distal interphalangeal joint. So there could be additions on the dorsal aspect of the joint with the central slip and the extensor apparatus. So what we would need in this patient would be to release the capsule contracture to ensure a good space for movement of the joint and we may also need to release the stuck flexors and extensors. It is also important to mobilize the joint early after the surgery with a resting splint. Considering these problems in a young manual laborer and considering the disadvantages of replacement of the joint, the plan that has been made for this patient is 
a gap arthroplasty with tenolysis and early mobilization. Having made the plan, we now need to discuss and counsel the patient about the planned procedure and the options that were available, the importance of therapy after the surgery and the expected results. Now we need to prepare for the surgery. As in any hand surgery, there are four basic requirements and all of them must be met even for this surgical procedure. They are a good magnification, a good light, use of a pneumatic tunicate and comfortable anesthesia. First, we must plan the markings that we are going to make for the incision to approach the PIP joint without damaging the neurovascular bundle or the flexor tendons. Traditionally, many incisions have been described like the Brunner's incision or the midlateral incision. We shall prefer the midlateral incision since we want to avoid scarring on the volar aspect. Having planned to make a neutral line incision, the question is which side are we going to do it on? On the ulnar side or the radial side? So the point to remember here is that we need to make the incision on the non-contact side of the finger. When we consider the fingers, the radial aspect of the index finger, middle finger and ring finger and the ulnar aspect of the little finger are the contact sides. The non-shaded area in this picture represents the non-contact area in which the incisions can be made without the risk of troublesome scars. I have demonstrated here the correct method of marking the midlateral incision but for purpose of clarity I have done it on the radial side of the index finger but this is not usually where you make a midlateral incision because we have already seen this is the contact area. So the incision is marked in this way so that even when extended it does not touch the crease lines and hence there is no contracture and also when we approach it through this incision we shall be approaching the joint on the anterior surface of the bone and posterior to the neurovascular bundles which is very safe. In this patient to make the markings on the non-contact side of the little finger since we are not able to flex the PIP joint to be able to mark as we have already seen I am making the incision I am making the marking at the junction of the slightly darker dorsal skin with the volar skin. This is also a technique of marking this incision. It is important to do this procedure under local anesthesia since we need to demonstrate the active movements on the table. Since it involves the little finger in this patient, an ulnar nerve block and a dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve block are given using a total of 5 ml of 2% lignocaine, 5 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine and 5 ml of distal water. Here the ulnar nerve block is being given and this shows the dorsal cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve being blocked to give complete loss of sensation over the dorsal aspect of the little finger also. Please click on the link shown above on the screen to see more details about the wrist block. The tunicae is raised now and the incision is made on the marked line and deepened through the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Usually since we have made the markings right, we will land dorsal to the neurovascular bundle and on the dorsal side of the flexor tendons. We dissect deeper raising the volar skin flap carefully. We need to avoid injuring the flexor tendons and the neurovascular bundle. Our aim is to reach the proximal interphalangeal joint posterior to the flexor tendons. We can identify the joint by one of the two methods. One is we can plunge the tip of the knife carefully at where we expect the joint and this will indicate the position of the joint or light rocking movements will denote the place if our dissection has removed some of the scar and allowed some movement. Now we need to release the volar part of the capsule or collateral ligaments and at the same time the dorsal part of the capsule must be released taking care to avoid injuring the central slip which is very closely applied to the dorsal aspect of the capsule. Once all the ligaments are divided then by what is known as the shotgun approach 
the degenerated base of the middle phalanx and head of the proximal phalanx are exposed. These involved portions of the bone are excised enough to allow a good comfortable space between the two bones to allow flexion and extension. The extensor tendons are tenolized for a short distance to allow full passive range of movement of the PIP joint. Now a trial flexion is done and patient is asked to look at his hand and flex the finger. It is important that the patient is able to look at his fingers when they are moving for two reasons. One is he will have no sensation so he will not be able to feel the movement that he is making. Secondly, when he sees the finger moving completely, he will have an incentive to do a good therapy postoperatively. Now the tunicate can be released and hemostasis should be achieved. We also need to be very careful that the tunicate time does not go beyond 15 minutes. After full release is confirmed and hemostasis achieved, the wound is closed, dressings are applied and a dorsal POP slab applied with the metacarpophalangeal joint in 90 degrees, PIP and DIP joints kept straight. A cut is made in the bandage over the palm region to allow flexion movements of the fingers. The post-operative protocol is as important as the surgery if not more. Active mobilization is started from the table. We have already demonstrated to the patient the active movements of the joint immediately after the release of the capsule and the tenolysis. These movements can be done with a protective dorsal blocking splint and supported with passive mobilization within pain limits. This is important because pain can offer a setback to the available movements. Removal of splint is done at one week and suture removal at 10 days. The mobilization continues till the joints become soft and supple and maximum range of movements has been achieved. This was the condition when the patient presented with the stiffness of the proximal interphalangeal joint in extension. This was on the post-operative day 2 when we removed the splint and demonstrated the movements that were possible. And at the end of 30 days, this was the movement available. There was about 80 to 90 degrees of flexion available at the proximal interphalangeal joint but there was still an extension lag of about 10 degrees at the distal interphalangeal joint of the finger. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about other procedures in surgery explained in a very simplified manner. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery. Banakkam.